Hello students, let us continue our discussion on the requirements engineering process in the software engineering course. So, yesterday we concluded the session with a sample requirements document. I had given a reference to the link of um, a document which is provided by Global Digital Megacorp freely available over the web and it talks about the requirements for student information, information management system. So, I do not know if you have gone through the link, but let us just see what is there in this uh, requirements document that has been provided to us. This is the requirements document, the requirements specification which is provided by the global di uh, digital mega corp. I uh, will just zoom this a little bit, okay. Yeah, I think uh, you can see it now, okay. So, uh, when you get into the uh, requirement specification of student information management system, they call it the version 1.0. As you scroll down, you with before they actually start of what are the requirements, they begin with what is called as a revision history. A very good way of telling how many iterations the requirements document has gone through. So, that is uh, the versions and what are the descriptions and who is the author, everything is there in this revision history. When was the first version released and when was the next version released? What we have here is the version 1.0. So, this is the, uh, the version and they started off with the requirement specification on some date. Later on, they revised it and they finalized the completed requirement specification as version 1.0. They say that it is proofread and completed requirements specification. When you just scroll down, you see that the student information management system requirements document begin from the contents page. So, yesterday we talked about what a requirement specification document should contain what are it con contents. So, a standard requirements document, if you can just recap, it, it could consist of interface, an introduction, a glossary, uh, uh, requirement specification, domain requirements, system specification, etcetera. It among other things, it might also have, it might also have some uh, uh, pictures, uh, diagrams, process uh, activities, uh, representation of process activities, so that whoever reads this understand what are the requirements of the system that is being developed. So, in the table of contents, very rightly they have uh, this introduction, the purpose of the system, the scope, the definitions, etcetera. And after the introduction, wherein it gives an overview to whoever is reading. Even though you and me are not a part of this development activity, when we read this purpose, the scope, the, dec uh, the definitions, what abbreviations they are using, we get an idea of what system has to be developed, correct. So, this introduction is going to give us an overview of something that is going to be developed. Then the overall description of the product that, uh, that they are developing is given in the product perspective. They talk about what are the various functions that this product supports, right. Product functions, the user characteristics, what are the assumptions that they have made while building this uh, document and what are the dependencies. If I have to put this doc, this software into place, it depends on what, what are the dependencies of this software when it is put to use, that is the dependencies. Then after the overall description of the product in picture, they talk about the system requirements. The system requirements talks about the functionality first part. The functional requirement specification they provide as functionality and they call it as FR. Okay. The non-functional requirement for their purpose they have called it as NFR. So, the functional requirement they have 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 functional requirement and the description of each of these functional requirements for the student management system is given in the uh, specified page number. So, what were the functional requirement for the student? student management system, student information management system. The functional requirements could be the student could ask for a transcript or a mark sheet whatever you call it, the transcript, somebody has to process it. So, 
that is a transcript request, centralized location, we will see what each of these are as we go down the document, records employee interface, viewing account balance etcetera, right. Then the usability of this, how do you use this system? When somebody is using this system, what are the usability requirements? What are the requirements or functionalities that has to be functionalities that has to be satisfied by this product in form of requirement, ok. So, it could be functional requirement or non-functional requirement. So, now you can just think of what we were talking as a non-functional requirement. I told you that a non-functional requirement can give rise to a functional requirement. Right, when you are trying to describe a non-functional requirement, that would give uh, uh, give rise to a new functional requirement which does which did not exist before. So the requirements refinement happens there. So here we have for usability requirement, we have a single sign-on functional requirement, another functional requirement which is requirement two, a more detailed and concise documentation for grades. Okay. So, for you need to document the grades for the student in order to generate a transcript, hence a concise documentation for grades. Then the non-functional requirement and account management, report information, web accessibility, what are the uh, intuitive interface, then ease of use is another non-functional requirement that they have specified. Under the reliability heading, they have reliability requirement 1, reliability requirement 2. What are, how do you say that this system is reliable? Based on the requirements required for the reliable uh, crash handling, then effective recovery, if something crashes, how does this system recover from its failure? That is effective recovery. Then they talk about the performance requirement considering the load and concurrency and dealing with large quantities of data. Okay. Then they also talk about supportability, minimum access requirements and system com communication. Next heading, so this was all under the heading of system requirements. Okay. The next heading is about the interfaces. So, if the, uh, if the entire software has different components, how do these components interact with each other, through what interfaces, then what is the interface that is provided to the user, user interface that is described as a part of user and software inter interface. Just remember that th this is just a example of how it will look for your understanding. This is not a, a standard uh, document that you all necessarily need to follow. Right. So, organizations might have their own uh, uh, reg rules and regulations on how a software requirements document should be written based on the standard template that we have studied. Right. So, this is just for your understanding that we are reading. Now, we will get into the details of it, the requirements specification. Now, the requirements specification, now first in the introduction, they are going to talk about the purpose. What, uh, what purpose are they talking? The purpose of this specification, the purpose of this document, this document describes software requirements for a web based student information management system, right. So, it is meant, now what is this student information management system? It is going to maintain a shared understanding of the requirements between developers and client of the system. Why do we require this document is the purpose of the document, ok. Then the scope. Now, Scope of this system describes what are the functionalities of this system, what can a student do with this system, because it is a student information management system, it is going to facilitate student activities. The basic function of the system is described as a scope, facilitate student activities such as registration, viewing of timetable, transcript, account balance and other information. Okay. Additionally, they can also use, uh, can, they can also be used by student records administrative department for viewing and closing transcript requests. Somebody gives a request, they need to see, process it, deliver the transcript and close the uh, request. Hence, that can also be done using this. So, th now we got an overview of what we can do with the system, right. As a student, you now can use the system 
to view timetable, to ask for transcript, account balance and other information you can check in your student management system. Because this document contains many different definitions, abbreviations, acronyms, etc., the document should specify what are the different abbreviations that they are using as a part of this specification. Now, this is very much important because when you say web TT, you might consider it a, in a different way and I could expand it in a different way. But what the person who is writing this document means should define it in this section, right. So, they use something called as the web view. So, this is a system for using, they use this word web view whenever they want to describe the system which is used for viewing the student records. Okay. So, they are going to use this and this contains many different kinds of tools like how you, they can view courses, grades, timetable among the other things. Then they use this abbreviation called web TT, web bridge etcetera, PIN change, okay, pin change may be for the pin codes, for changing student pin codes, web TT is for the web timetable, course listings, what are the courses which are available, which are uh, uh, being conducted, what are the availability for these courses for a student to register into, all those things they talk with web TT. Then PIN is the personal identification, even PIN is an abbreviation which they have used here and hence they have uh, they expanded the abbreviation. So, this is uh, something very nice. So, legacy system, this is a database of information which um, uh, regarding the student records. There could already exist some system which uh, the people are uh, currently using it manually and they are going that, that contains the student records. So, the student records could be a database of information that they are going to use. Records employee, now records employee when they use wherever, they mean an employee, they mean an employee. What is his role? He works for the records office and he is going to handle all the transcript requests. Okay. So, whenever they say records employee, this should come into your mind. So, now we know the importance of this section. Then they have used some references wherein they say that uh, web systems they have used these references. If uh, any references are existing for this document, you need to follow that reference. Then overview that uh, this document, overview of what? Overview of this document, okay. What is there in what section? So, they talk about section 2 and section 3. Section 2 is the overall description of the system and section 3, they talk about having specific requirements for the system. Okay. So, that is the overview. Now, this was the first section. So, that is why they do not have an overview for section 1. Now, section 2 is overall description wherein they have the product perspective. We will not go into too much of detail into uh, everything, but we will just see the heading so that we get to know what are they trying to depict as a product functions. Okay. So, product perspective perspective how this system works, for whom it works. Okay. So, they talk that, uh, they tell that the system will be designed for students and there will be a feature to also allow records administration people to handle the requests that are generated by the students. Okay. It will also work with the existing university database. So, this kind of a system like we talked so much about yesterday should fit into an environment where systems already exist. Okay. That is why this is a very important, uh, this uh, document was very apt for giving an example and that is why I have chosen this document. Okay. Now, what are the product functions? Product functions if you want to describe, then you will have the, there you will have to identify the user of this product first thing. The, that is what they have done. The, if the user is a student, what are the product, what are the product functions? If the user is a records employee, what are the product functions? So, if, it, if he is a student, he is directed to a main page, then it has links to other sections, course timetable, records, etcetera. Then he can register for a course, he can view the course timetable, then he can uh, see his accounts page, 
for uh, whatever financial details, whether he has paid the fees, how much is remaining, what is the balance, etc. If he has a l account with the uh, internet account or something specific uh, to the organization or institution that he is studying in and what is the account remaining there, what is the balance remaining in that account. The records page also uh, it will display the information rec uh, regarding his academic pro progress, etc. Okay. So, if I am a student, I can do all these things as a part of the student information management system. Okay. Then, if the user is a records employee, then what he can do? He, is, he can process his um, student record details based on whatever request the student has asked for. Okay. So, we identified students and what are the requirements for each? We, uh, we identify the user of this product and we have identified what are the functionalities of each of these users. Okay. Then the user characteristics. Okay. Now, what there are two groups of users. Now, we already know students and record employees. Okay. Here, what is the uh, characteristic of a student and what is the characteristic of records employee. Now, students they need to view information and manage the records etcetera. So, ease of learning should be a priority for this use of your user group. Now, what requirement I have to give priority for this user that is what they have identified here. Then what requirement I have to prioritize for the records employee user okay, for him because he is going to process request that is given by student may be the uh, efficiency of their workflow is the priority. Okay. So, based on the user, what are their priorities? The requirements can be prioritized using this, using the characteristics of the users. Okay. Then, assumptions and dependencies. What do you assume? We assume that everyone in the uh, who is going to use the system has access to internet and the speed of that internet is something, uh, some number or above. Okay. So, this is an assumption. Okay. Now, you are developing this assuming that there is internet connectivity to everybody who wants to access this and that has to be written down. You, whatever assumptions and dependencies you make needs to be written down under the assumption C. Now, this system is depended upon by many users. Therefore, it should be able to deal with thousands of users logging onto the system at any one time everybody can access this system through the internet. So, I cannot have a restriction on how many users can be ca accessing this system at a time. So, we say that it is you know, depended on so many users, so many users. So, it should be able to deal with so many people logging at a certain time. Okay. Then, what are the system requirements, the functional requirement and the non-functional requirements we are going to see. Functional requirement is a transcript request, a centralized location, records employee interface and viewing account balance. They talk about the transcript request because the system must allow the students to requ for request for their grade cards or transcripts from the web view. All these requests are going to be sent and managed by the university records database. Fine. So, the functional requirement uh, is that this system should be allow the students to require for official re request for official transcript. What happens next is also depicted. What happens to this request is also the next statement. So, this is how you specify a functional requirement. The next one is talks about the centralized location. So, instead of having each system as a separate ent ent entity, they want to consolidate everything into one central system and maintain the functionality of each of these systems. Okay. That is just another requirement because it this is very much required why because they have their own functionalities called web view, web registration, everything is done over the web. So, this is this was a hard and fast requirement. Next records employee interface and this is a person, this is another user, he will have a separate login credential. Okay. He will have a separate login credential with which he can log in and then he can connect to the transcript database. From there, he can process the request of every student who is generating a transcript request. 
fine. So, that is the records employee interface and then the viewing the account uh, balance a student can uh, uh, view his outstanding balances related to fee payment etcetera and other things. So, that is another functional requirement. Okay. Then we talk about the usability requirement, single sign on. For usability requirement, the format that this organization has followed is what is the input, what is the function processing and what is the output. This is one very good way of writing a requirement, what input this system takes, what is the processing that is done and what is the output. Okay. So, single sign on, the, this is basically to check if the entered student number and password is valid. So, he input is the student enters the number and the password. The system is going to check if it is valid, the username and password is valid and it is going to give author, authorization to the student to access his record or information uh, if, if at all he has entered a valid student number and password. Okay. Then what could be the output? Output is that this uh, the user he is going the system is going to allow the user to log in page if the um, uh, if the student number or password is invalid. Now what if it is correct what happens? If it is wrong what is the output? What is the output? Again the login page should reappear right. So that is the output right. Generally when we think about output we tend to forget to specify what the student, what the uh, product should not do, right. So, so that also is a part of requirement, fine. The system provides user with options to access different records if at all his username and password is correct, fine. Then the usability requirement which is a functional, there is a more detailed and concise documentation for grades. So, what is the functionality of all that is given, we will just see a few non-functional requirement like uh, a usability requirement 3 which they say the accounts management. Okay. So, non-functional requirement is that the new system should function such that the user signs in it, it provides him with all the information combined for old systems without having to re-login when they want to change from one service to next. There is already a uh, system that is existing. Okay. When the student is using this new system, the details that is stored in the old system should also be reflected based on his query. Okay. Based on his uh, requirement, the old system records needs to be reflected. Now, he does not have to log into old system first, see his details, then come into new system, no. So, it should be merged with the, the old system or the legacy system that already exists should be merged into the existing system. The new system will also allow record employees to log into system view and process transcri transcript requests. So, that is about the account management and uh, we will see the ease of use part of the non-functional requirement. So, in this non-functional requirement, the new system they say should have a tool to the help students to produce their timetable instead of them spending time looking at timetable and manually planning it. Okay. So, uh, probably they are trying to automate the timetable generation for that uh, student. So, this functionality does not replace the old system of planning timetable manually, but this it is an additional feature that can be used. So, for the ease of use of a certain student while talking to the customer or the client who has given this product requirement they have realized that there is a manual process that the students are doing that is manually planning their own timetable based on the availability of courses, then they have tried to replace that manual planning to automated planning. Okay. And they say that it is not going to replace the old system, but this is an additional feature in the new system. Okay. Okay. Then they talk about the reliability, crash handling very important how do you handle reliability has to be described as a part of non, non functional requirement right when you have something like uh, crash handling in the uh, in the product in the event of the system crash the current transaction will either be completed or not completed 
this will be handled by an already existing database. Now, who is going to handle this is also specified. Okay. So, that whoever is going to read this requirement specification will get the in and out of every transaction that he is going to do. What is the requirement? What if it fails? What happens? Who is going to handle what? Who is going to see what? What records are handled by whom? Etcetera. Right. So, the reliability there is another effective recovery. The system will if must effectively recover from cache within 5 seconds. There is a timing constraint there. Right. We identified a timing constraint. So, they have a requirement that the system should come up after crash within 5 seconds. Okay. So, it should be able to restart session with the user within the time limit. Okay. When I say my system should come up within 5 seconds, that is put as a recovery part time constraint under the non-functional requirement. Okay. So, the next thing is about the performance like this they have described what are the performance requirements, what are the supportability requirements that exist etcetera. Okay. You can just read through it and you will understand. The next thing that they have is the interfaces, the user interface and the software interface, user and software interface. So, they have main access page welcome which is a welcome page or as soon as a student signs in or the um, records employee signs in that is the first page that they see. Okay. Now, what is there in the students main? What will happen when the students log in? What will happen when the records employee sign in? So, what is there in the students main page? Each of these pages he has links to each of these page, pages. Right, course registration, course timetable, student account, transcript and records. Now, this section which talks about interface is going to give us a details of what is present in each of the links that are provided in the main page. Okay. See here the course registration page what it contains, what are the subsections in that course registration page, course timetables page what it contains, students account page, transcript and records etcetera. Okay. So, this way they have lot of software requirements uh, specification for a student information management system for a university. Now, this was just uh, to give you an idea of how a requirements document is built. So, this is a real life case scenario which we have taken and we have seen to get a uh, suitable understanding of how a requirements document should be. Now, we will move on uh, with our uh, course. Okay. So, this is what we just did. Then, there are certain tools that organizations use to specify the system requirements. The first kind of a tool, we have just given an overview in the previous uh, session, we are uh, we have just thought about it that we can use structured language. After the problems with natural language, we have seen that we can use structured language. Now, what is the structured language? A structured language is a language which is very much similar to your programming language. If you if you already have an idea of uh, some programming language, you will see that this structured language is much similar to that. So, the way you write a program, you can write uh, write requirement specification in a structured manner like that. For example, let us take a uh, system requirements for address book. We are, develop, uh, we are uh, trying to develop a address book. Right. We will just take one case, one option out of the address book and see how we can write the re system requirement using structured language for an address book. Okay. So, the case is that the list option is selected, list of list the addresses in the address book. So, when I click on list, maybe it is going to show the first three addresses, okay. first three addresses and there would be a down arrow when assume that there is a down arrow, when I click on the down arrow, what happens? If down arrow is pressed, the list should be scrolled, right. So, scroll the addresses, scroll the addresses. Else, if I do not press the down arrow, then what? Then I will be pressing some alphabet key in the combo box, list plus entering text that is the combo box. So, I will be entering some alphabet text in the uh, in the text box there, when 
the alphabet key is pressed what should what should happen display the first address starting from that alphabet okay the first address in the address book starting from the for starting with that alphabet plus should be displayed so for a small requirement for a small requirement of our address book to list the addresses this is how we can write a requirement using structured language this is just one example another kind of an approach to specify the system requirements is the form based approach okay so you use a standard format for specifying the requirements that's a form based approach so in the form based approach approach what do we have we we will have something like the definition of the function or entity what is the definition of that function the descriptions of input where they come from what is the output of that function indication of any other entity that is required for satisfying this requirement what are the pre condition for this requirement what are the post conditions that are for this requirement and this is just an optional one if it is appropriate in the context that you are using you can make use of it but the advantage of this is that using a form based approach is that it is going to eliminate all the problems that we discuss discussed about the natural language and it brings in uniformity in the description of requirement and comprehensiveness you are going to get each and every detail of every functionality required in that system right so now that we have seen a requirements document it had something like this what is the input to a certain function what is the function describe uh, describe what could be the output etc right so we can associate that document with this uh, okay but the problem with this uh, form based approach is that if you have an interaction between entities it is very difficult to describe the interaction between two entities interaction you cannot specify interaction as a form based approach we'll just see an example of how a form based approach would look like all of us now know the this uh, case study insulin pump control uh, system which we have discussed in our module 1 beginning right what is the function of this insulin pump control system it is going to compute insulin dose for a safe sugar level right for a safe sugar then the description of this function okay so what is the description that it is going to compute the dose of insulin that is to be delivered when the current measured sugar level is in the safe zone between 3 and 7 units so what is safe zone what are the units that is specified here in the description okay so this gives me an entire idea of what this computation is now fine so what are the inputs that you get you need a current sugar reading to compute insulin dose correct a current sugar reading and they are going to make use of previous two readings that is r0 and r1 what are the notations that they are going to use if at all they have a mathematical model associated with this computation they may they might make use of these variables r0 r1 and r2 and that is why they have rightfully uh, described what is r1 r0 and r2 right in the beginning here okay then what is the source from where do you get input the sh current sugar reading is from sensor other readings are from something that is stored in the memory that is r0 and r1 previous uh, two readings okay then what is the output the output is the dose in insulin that is to be delivered which they call it as computational dose or comp dose okay then what is the destination where this output should go the destination of the output should be the main control loop once entering the main control loop what happens is the action is the description that you can see here in the action okay so this is a requirement okay please remember this is the requirement for a certain function to compute insulin dose for this pump control system right so this is just one requirement and what it requires what is the pre condition what is the post condition what are the side effects etc everything is described here okay but when the, this is not the only functional requirement for our insulin pump control software there are many other functions so 
this interaction between one component and other component cannot be described here cannot be described here. So, this is just an example of how we make use of form based approach. This is like a form right, this is like a form they give you the, the form will have function, description, input, source, output, destination etcetera. You just need to fill it in something like a how you fill a certain form. Next is the tabular model. Now, this is again a supplementary to your natural language then this is very useful when you have so many different alternative actions to be taken based on a certain calculation. Okay. If this is the value then do this, if this is not the value do this, if the value is between this and this do this. So, this generally happens with our insulin con pump control system. So, whatever is described previously can also make use of so something called as a tabular model wherein you make the condition as one column and what action to be taken based on this condition as another column. Okay. It is tabulated in a form like this for example, sugar level when R 2 is less than R 1 the computational dose is 0, when it is equal to R 1 it is 0. Okay. Then sugar level is increasing and the rate of increase is stable or it is increasing your, you have a computation that needs to be calculated then you do certain calculations and determine the amount of insulin that needs to be pumped. Okay. So, this is better read. Now, instead of reading every sentence here, every line here and trying to understand what it does, now it gave us this tabular format give us the ease of understanding how a requirement needs to be specified. Okay. So, that is about the tabular model. The next thing is a graphical model. Graphical model of a requirement specification can make use of certain UML diagram, unified modeling language. I have just uh, given you a brief overview in one of the sessions. Unified modeling language consists of different depictions that is different diagrams to depict different types of interaction between the components in a system or inside a system. So, we have something called as a class diagram, we have a object diagram, activity diagram, sequence diagram, component diagram, deployment diagram etcetera. We have so many different types of UML diagrams and these UML diagrams are, um, are made use of when the state need, uh, needs to be changed or when you want to specify the overall structure architecture of a certain system or you want to depict a sequence of actions for a certain system, you make use of this UML diagram. Similarly, when there is a requirement for a certain system that, ref that defines a sequence of actions that needs to be performed, then it can be best depicted by UML sequence diagram. Okay. For example, a ATM system wherein you can go check your balance or withdraw money from right. So, that ATM system works on the basis of sequencing of events that occur between the user and the system. Okay. We will just take that example and see how we can use a graphical model in order to depict certain requirements for that system. So, the example is a sequence diagram for ATM and what is the problem? Show the sequence of events that take place during some user interaction with the system. What are the sequence of events that occur when me as a user is interacting with the ATM system? So, cash withdrawal from an ATM is the event. I am going to withdraw cash from an ATM. So, first thing needs to be done, validate the card, handle the request and then complete the transaction. Okay. The, this can be depicted in form of a sequence diagram which looks something like this. This is a UML sequence diagram where you see a stick man here who is called as an actor of the system. He could represent the user of the system or the client or the customer of the system. He is the one who is going to interact with the system. Okay. ATM is an entity and so is a database these things are the entities. What you see here has uh, rectangles here, they are all the timelines. The sequence of events occur ac according to a certain timeline. Okay. These are all the timelines. Now, when an actor comes, he inserts the card into the ATM. That is the first event that occurs. Immediately after that, you see there is a time gap. The next 
events, uh, event is the, the card number is going to be sent to the database for validation, right? If the card uh, is okay, then the database should say that the card is okay and then it is going to request, the system is going to ask the client to enter his PIN, that is PIN request. Then you and the, uh, you as a actor enter the PIN, e enter the PIN and then this validation happens here. During this process, the validation happens, the validation happens and if at all it is an invalid card, exception is generated saying that the card is invalid. Only when the card is validated, the next sequence of events can happen. He can send a withdraw request. Then when he sends a withdraw request, the ATM has to check right how much uh, whether uh, he, he maybe the uh, atm wants to check and see if the balance uh, what balance he has and show him the balance first before he actually enters the amount okay uh, actually enters the amount if he has zero balance then no need of asking him to enter the amount at all fine so there is a set of sequence of events that happens before withdrawing and after withdrawing until the cash is removed and the repeat uh, receipt for the transaction is generated is generated you can represent every single transaction or every single activity as a part of this entire sequence in a sequence diagram in a sequence diagram like this now as a requirements document now you know that the card number has to be verified he has to insert the card there should be a provision to take in his card and take in retrieve his card number send it to the database database should uh, have a function to check the validity of the card then the functionality to request for the pin right and then exception generation is another functionality request for amount then card removal generation of receipt so many different functions we got to know by ri just writing one sequence diagram Right? How many different functions between entities, who is going to interact with whom, actor is going to interact with ATM, ATM with database. Right? So, we got to know many different things just by seeing one sequence diagram. Sequence diagram. Okay. So, having seen that we need to write a requirement specification in order to conduct, um, in order to have, uh, in order to conduct the design because this requirement specification is going to provide us uh, the input in order to carry out our design for the software development process. Okay? Because these requirements as we have seen, they keep changing over a period of time, there should be somebody to understand what, why the requirement is changing and manage these changing requirements. And that is why we need to study requirements management. Requirements management deals with the process of understanding and controlling the changes that uh, du changes in the requirements for a certain software development during the requirements engineering process and during the development of the system. It is not just in the requirements process or requirements activity phase that the requirements is going to change. Of course, it is going to iterate, we are going to iterate there. But during the development at different stages of development of a certain software also the requirements tend to change. Right? So, what are the somebody should control the changing of the requirement and that is why requirements management is important. Requirements are uh, no matter what you do they are they change, they tend to change, they can be incomplete and they can be inconsistent also. It is the quality of a requirement that it is inconsistent, it is ambiguous, it is incomplete, etc. So, new requirements emerge during the process of development or during the process of design or during the process of testing and the understanding of the requirements or the understanding of the system as a whole changes during these processes. When the understanding changes, the requirements generally or it should change, right? It should change and this change in requirements should be incorporated, should be incorporated into the existing system. So, all these things, all these changing, incompleteness, inconsistency, they need reconciliation and 
they need management there should be somebody to manage these requirements okay now <coughs> the requirements evolution how does the requirements requirements evol evolve over time that is how does it change now what why does it change can also uh, be a question but what is the process of requirements evolution very simple um, uh, picture here to actually tell us that there is a system that uh, which we have understood it in the initially there is a okay for a certain system development there is a problem statement which ha we have a initial understanding about and based on that initial understanding we have initial requirement specification okay when you have the initial requirement specification as and when you are writing the requirements document or the functionality or the non function non functional requirements the domain requirements not to forget you get a different view of the same problem you might have get a changed understanding of the existing problem which in turn leads to change requirement this change requirement again this change requirement again needs to be incorporated in our system requirement so over a period of time the requirements evolution happens so this is the uh, timeline and uh, initial understanding over a period of time there is a changed understanding of the problem and the requirements are changed so that's the re requirements evolution process so from the evolution perspective that is from the change perspective point of view these requirements can be again classified we have classified uh, requirements uh, in many ways previously so you need to remember all those things and this is the next kind of a classic uh, classification based on the evolution perspective the requirements can be classified as enduring requirement and volatile requirement now we'll just see what is the basic definition of enduring requirement this enduring requirement is generally the basic requirement for a certain organization or for a certain system okay something that does not change for a long time for over a long period of time i should say okay so they are relatively stable requirements okay for example a payroll system uh, if you want to do a payroll automated system for a certain organization definitely you will have employee you will definitely have to capture their earnings you will definitely have to capture their deductions okay so that's a payroll system so something that does not change is having employees their earnings their deductions etc for the same systems what is a volatile requirement volatile requirement is a requirement that is likely to change over the period of time during different software development activity maybe during software development itself okay during the implementation phase itself it could change or during the testing phase it could change for example you have this income tax slab every now and then it gets it could get changed it is not constant for over a period of time right for a long period of time it could keep changing every now and then based on the government right government policies regarding the income tax might change the slab to be deducted right the slab could change the amount to be deducted the percentage could change anything could change so that's a volatile requirement again the volatile requirements need to be classified into can need to be classified further based on how volatile they are and why are they volatile so they are classified into four different types such as the mutable requirements the emergent requirements the consequential requirements and compatibility requirements so we need to get into details of uh, each of these requirements uh, type and uh, just remember that uh, the enduring requirements are stable requirements and volatile requirements are change changing requirements that change during the development of the software activity or the development process and again it is classified into four different types each of which which we will uh, see in detail in the next session that we are going to meet thank you